Okay, today we're going to be talking chapter 18 in McKernan's textbook. This is Diagnostic Sampling and Therapeutic Techniques. I actually won't be talking about every single thing that is listed in the chapter, so if you want further information, I suggest you do some extra reading. Um, additionally, in this uh, chapter we'll have, or in this lecture, there are going to be a ton of videos uh, and descriptions. Uh, my recommendation for taking a look at this chapter um, uh, on your own without me reading over it is to download it from eLearn, put it in presentation mode, and then you will be able to navigate through videos and through definitions and through examples, etc., um, as it's set up as a, as a lecture. All right, so first of all, we're going to be talking about how do we administer medication to small animals, the, the different key terms, how we give it, and why it's important to know these things um, so that you understand what is the best way to give medication. There are a lot of routes that are available, and it really depends on the patient's condition and temperament. Are they a good patient? Are they able to take the medication? Um, are you able to give the medication, or will they bite your finger off? Um, the type of medication that we need to give, um, and not every medication comes in every form. Um, some things come just as injectable medication. Some things come just as oral medication, so we need to understand that. Um, are we going to give fluid, and how are we going to give that fluid? How quickly do we need to get this fluid or medication into the patient? We're going to talk about what is the most bioavailable uh, method of getting medication into an animal. Bioavailability refers to how the body is able to use that medication. Is it able to use it about 40% or about 80% or about 100%? Um, and of course, the, the, if we have 100% bioavailability almost immediately, that is um, the, the way to get the animals it help it needs as quickly as possible. There are other medications that we may not want to be 100% bioavailable or we want it to last a little bit longer because if it's 100% bioavailable very quickly, it's gonna get into the, and out of the tissues really quickly. So it means it won't last very long. So we need to keep that in mind as well. Also cost, there are some really good medications out there but people can't afford them or we can't afford to give them. Uh, we need to know how easy we can uh, uh, it is to administer it. Um, there are some medications that are very difficult to administer and need to be done in a sterile environment. And if you don't have that sterile environment, you won't be able to administer it. And then we need to know are we wanting a systemic effect or a local effect or we do we want to um, uh, well, systemic meaning the whole body or local meaning right at the site. And local um, can refer to an entire system as well. For instance, the digestive system or D GI system. Uh, if we want to keep the medication within the GI system and treat the lining of the GI system, that would be more of a local effect, but it's affecting a much whole body. We're going to talk about injections first, and there are four different types of injections primarily when we're going through the skin. There's intramuscular, subcutaneous, intravenous, and intradermal. Now each one of these has a different effect uh, and um, a different rate of um, how the medication moves into the system. All of these are seeking vessels or, or blood vessels so that they can move through the system. If you think about where the blood vessels are, obviously IV intravenous is putting directly into blood vessel, directly into the bloodstream, and so that's going to increase your speed and the uh, bioavailability of the medication. Muscle has the second most amount of blood vessels and so that's going to rank a little bit lower than IV and then subcutaneous after that a little few a little fewer blood vessels but still quite a few. Um, intradermal has very very few blood vessels and so this the uh, effect will be local in that um, instance. When we are holding it's very important to pay attention to the way that we hold the uh, syringes um, and if you'll note, intramuscular, the plunger, is outside of the hand, and every other hold, the plunger is inside the hand, uh, within the palm, versus outside of the palm. 
okay? So it is important to pay attention to these types of holds because this is the way that we're gonna want you to hold um, a syringe. If you would like to practice with your pen or your pencil right now, that would be a really good idea. So intramuscular, you'd be, it'd be like you're writing on a piece of paper, okay? Subcutaneous, you're gonna take the end of your pencil or your pen and you're gonna slide it into your palm instead. So you're just gonna change where that plunger is. Uh, intravenous, you're just gonna change that angle a little bit more. And intradermal, you're gonna put, bring your hand over the top of that. And that just changes the angle based on where these tissues are. Okay, so 90 degree angle to go intramuscular, 45 to 60 degree to go subcutaneous, Intravenous is a little bit shallower, so about uh, 20 to 30 degrees. Um, the important thing to remember with IV is that you can stick it in the vein and then go all the way through. So we want to stick it in the vein until you can see this needle has a bevel here, and that bevel always should face up or away from you. Okay, so this bevel is going to go into, you're going to pierce into the vessel, and then you're going to change the angle again to go a little bit shallower, kind of like this intradermal, so you can follow along with the vessel, okay? Intradermal is right uh, between the epidermis and the dermis, um, and we're going to just put a little bleb of fluid there. Not a lot of fluid. It's going to stay in that one spot. It's going to separate the layers of the skin a little bit. This is the slide that should be the most helpful for you, but again, you need to put your um, lecture in, download it to your computer and put it in presentation mode in order to see it. If you click on the, uh, the item that is, um, uh, there, it's a different color and it is underlined, so it says oral, and we have an abbreviation, so if you were writing in notes and you didn't want to write oral, you can just say PO or per os, that's Latin. Um, and you click on that and it's going to give you an explanation definition of what we can give orally. So you can go through the, uh, the administration and the procedures, uh, that you can find. And the, there's a pilling syringe that we can use if we have an animal that's a biter, so we don't put our fingers in the mouth. Uh, and then when you're finished looking at these um, descriptions, you can press that uh, go back button. I'll take you back to the slide. Additionally, I have for you videos. And if you click on this video, it will take you out of the lecture to a YouTube um, channel. And, uh, and it will help, it, you can actually see this happening. So this is a really important slide for you. I recommend that you go through each one of these and you take your time to go through it you are going to want to revisit this if you get in the program um, because these are all the things that we're going to expect you to be able to do with confidence. So the other thing that this slide explains is what kind of medications can we give, whether it's, and, and uh, this is talking about their formulations. So are they formulated into a tablet, a liquid, a powder, medicated patches, gels, uh, solutions, um, those kind of things. And then talks about bioavailability, uh, not only how much of the medication that you're injecting or giving orally gets to the, to the tissues where it's needed, but also how long does it take to get there, okay? So if you look through this, you will note that intravenous, 80 to 100% in 60 seconds, or in seconds to minutes, 80 to Whereas IM, which is clo uh, pretty close to that, and sub-Q, is 60 to 90%. So never get 100% unless you're giving um, IV. Again, oral or orogastric, nasogastric, things that go into the digestive tract may or may not get uh, all the way into the rest of the tissues. There are some medications we want to keep in the digestive tract. For instance, parasitic, uh, anti-parasite medications. Uh, if it's digestive parasites or GI parasites, we only want to treat within the uh, digestive tract, okay? Um, some other words you may want to review um, so that you know what they mean is oral, which means ear, and ophthalmic, which means eye. So uh, ear and eye, those might be a little bit new for you. 
Um, our abbreviation for that is AU if it's both ears, OU if it's both eyes. So think U as universal, it's both right and left, okay? Um, we will change this to D or S if we are talking about, so AD or OD would be the right eye or right ear. OS or AS would be the left eye and ear. And D stands for dextro and S stands for sinister. And those are the Latin uh, words for right and left. Uh, we have a couple other things uh, here on this next slide, intratracheal, interosseous, and intraperitoneal. Uh, these are also some things that you'll need to know about uh, as well. And we'll go through some of these a little bit in a little bit. All right, so IV catheters, something you will need to know how to do. Um, it allows us to get temporary venous a uh, access, so we're looking at the vein primarily. There are some times we want to put it in the artery, but most of the time we're going to put it in the vein, and the vein is the, um, uh, is the direct route back to the heart. The artery is the direct route from the heart to the body tissues, but we put things in the vein because the arteries are under pressure and are much more difficult to, to keep from bleeding if we puncture it. So we want to do it in the vein, and we want to have a, a catheter placed so that we have some access for medications or fluid or electrolyte replacement or if we have to get blood products. The, the place where we're going to put the catheter is going to depend on do, what vessels are available. If the vessels are uh, in good shape um, and if the patient, uh, you know, it may be that we have to choose one leg over another depending on the patient. Also the expense of placing the catheters and how quickly we need to get it in. Uh, there are catheters, a lot of different types of catheters, um, and the length and the gauge, gauge means how thick or, or wide the catheter is, is going to depend on how big the patient is, what kind of species it is, and what vein we're going to be placing it in. Uh, most of the veins that we might place, for instance, in a normal size cat would be a 22 gauge, one and a half inch or one inch catheter over the needle catheter and I'll explain uh, over the needle here shortly. Um, a kitten would be a 25 gauge one inch catheter. Um, a large uh, horse would be a three inch 16 or 18 gauge catheter. So the smaller the number on the gauge the bigger bore of the needle and we honestly want to give as big get as big a needle or as big a catheter in the patient as we possibly can get. It actually causes less damage to the vein um, and it's actually not any more painful. The thicker needle isn't any more painful than a smaller needle. Um, four category, categories of the IV access devices. This is the winged needle. It's a, called, also called a butterfly needle. You might um, see why here. Uh, and this is has a needle but no actual plastic catheter. So we only place this tempor really temporarily so for quick access because we can't leave a needle in the skin and in the vessel. It will just, as the patient moves, it will continue to cause tissue damage. The most common one is the over-the-needle catheter, and this is B here. It has a uh, hub here and a plastic catheter and under or within that plastic catheter is the needle so we can place the catheter and then remove the needle leaving the plastic uh, inside so the needle helps us gain access through the skin and into the vessel and the catheter is left inside now that soft plastic catheter doesn't do as much damage uh, to the vessel the through the needle catheter is actually here D a through the needle catheter tends to be much longer, has to be placed sterilely. Um, we place a, uh, this needle into the skin. We pull this um, catheter back um, beyond the needle. It's pushed, actually pushed up. We wouldn't do that until we were ready to place it because this is all sterile in here. Uh, this is sterile too. When we, all of this, we would have in a cap until we place it. Um, we're going to put the needle into the um, patient 
and then thread the catheter through the needle all the way into the vessel. And this is going to be used for bigger veins. So for a jugular vein um, or a, um, a, a set, what we call a central vein, typically it's the jugular vein. Uh, this needle can't be removed. So we will, be, we will pull it out of the skin, put a needle guard on it, and tape it uh, to the skin so it can't cause any damage to the skin or the vessel and leave the plastic in. This is called a multi-lumen catheter. So we're going to place this catheter into the skin um, and then we're going to tape this hub and then realize that we have three different ports that we can put medications. These are for medications that cannot be mixed um, until they're obviously in the, in the body. So this, these are uh, multi-lumen, or uh, lumen meaning uh, like tube or opening. Uh, that's the type of catheter. So the wing needle IV uh, catheter, just to review, called a butterfly catheter. It's for short-term use. Usually use it for blood collection in cats. We can administer non-irritating medications, but we have to realize it's easier to, easy to puncture the vessel wall and that will allow sub-Q infiltration. So that means that whatever medicine we're putting in may not go into the vessel the way we want it to. Um, that those plastic wings, uh, we can hold on to it because it's very small. Uh, it helps us to place that uh, directly into the um, animal's vein. The over the needle catheter is most commonly used catheter. We use it on peripheral veins. So what are peripheral veins? Our cephalic vein our saphenous vein. Um, catheter is fitted outside or over a steel uh, needle, over the needle, um, and the needle point extends beyond the catheter so that we can enter the vein. Once we get blood coming back, we call it a flashback. Uh, once we get some blood coming back, then we may advance it just a millimeter more, very, very small amount, and then advance the plastic part as we pull the needle out. The through the needle catheter used in the jugular vein, once we have it in place, we put that, uh, take the needle out and put a needle guard. Um, that plastic sleeve that you saw here is one way to keep this uh, catheter sterile as we're placing it. The multi-lumen catheter, we have two or three lumina um, or tubes going into one catheter. Uh, it allows simultaneous infusions at one catheter site. Uh, we often have to um, use a guide wire to, to place it. It is more expensive than other IV catheters, and it's not something we will typically use in a general practice. Here's another uh, video for you to watch. Again, you're going to need to download and uh, put this in presentation uh, view uh, in order to look at it. Um, I want you, when you watch these videos, I need you to imagine you're the person placing this catheter or you're the person holding the pet. So really put yourself into that position. Um, general procedure supplies. Uh, we are going to need, obviously, the catheter. We're going to need a syringe filled, filled with either saline or something, uh, saline with a little bit of heparin in it that will keep the blood from clotting as we place it an injection cap or T connector, something that will block the end of the catheter so we don't get bleeding all over the place, tape or non-absorbable suture. So often we, we tape these catheters into place, uh, some bandage material, clippers, and an antiseptic scrub and solution. So there's a written explanation of the technique here. Uh, we never use a relief hole. I have this here um, because it's in the book. Um, but we, we would never actually, a relief hole is when you nick the skin um, in order to um, be able to get through the uh, skin more easily and directly to the uh, vessel. Okay, so here is the procedure, um, and you can, uh, whoop, and it goes into intratracheal without, so we'll uh, just go back to the lecture, and that's where it takes us. So, um, I do want you to understand that you can find these things within this lecture so you can go back and review. So with cats, we're going to do a cephalic or medial saphenous vein, with it, which is the rear leg, uh, front leg, rear leg. With the dog, we're going to do either lateral saphenous or cephalic veins, um, and again, uh, front or rear legs. 
we want to look at the catheter. Uh, it says inspect every 48 hours or as needed, but I would say that you probably need to inspect it more frequently. Some things we're going to look at um, and, uh, and change the catheter and put it in a different location. Uh, if we see phlebitis, which is inflammation of the vessel, infection, thrombosis, which is when we have um, clotting at the site, uh, if we have leaking at the insertion site um, around the catheter, it just means that things are not getting into the vein. They're going to the sub Q and out through the hole that you put in the skin. Um, so if we're f and we want to flush that catheter out pretty frequently, so we would want to check it every time we flush it. So every couple of hours, if we're not putting a catheter, we're going to want to flush it out with some saline. If there's any pain when we inject a medication, that's a good indication that it's not in the vessel. Or if we have any portion of the catheter that is exposed outside of the skin, all that plastic should be in the skin in the vessel. All of the white plastic that's part of the catheter. If the catheter looks, site looks good, then we want to clean it with iodophore, uh, which is betadine or chlorhexidine solution. Allow it to dry and then cover it. We don't want to leave a catheter in place longer than 72 hours. Also, if the bandage gets wet, we need to understand why it's wet. So is the animal getting it wet from the outside or is it getting wet from the inside because it's uh, leaking from the site? If the patient is molesting the bandage, chewing it, licking it, we want to know why because usually they do that when it's uncomfortable. Um, if they're not, if the catheter isn't being used with a fluid to keep it open, we're going to want to uh, flush it every four hours. Um, if we're going to keep some bags of heparinized saline, uh, which actually has been determined that heparinized saline is not necessary, it's kind of a holdover, um, as long as we're flushing with saline, it should work just fine. Um, but if we are using heparinized saline, we do want to discard it every 12 to 24 hours. Catheters not used for a prolonged uh, period of time should be fitted with a heparin lock. That's whether you're flushing it or not. Um, it's a type of um, uh, cap that you put over the catheter that has heparin in it that will keep things from clotting. One of the major reasons that we might use an IV catheter is for IV chemotherapy. We would never inject chemotherapeutic agents. They're, they're um, cytoxic or they kill cells. Um, that's their job. And so we want to get that directly into the vein so that we're not killing the tissue cells in the area. So we would never inj directly inject chemotherapeutic agent into an animal. We would always have a catheter and we would have to make sure that that catheter is completely patent or it has a direct flow into uh, the vessel. All right, so some sampling techniques in small animals. How do we get the samples we need, the diagnostic samples we need, in order to find out what is wrong with this animal? They don't talk. I don't know if you've realized that. They don't talk. Um, so a lot of times we have to search for clues. So this is how we do it. So first of all, we get blood. Um, blood is a very common way to get an idea of what's going on with the individual cells, but also with the chemistry uh, within the body. So we're going to need a needle and syringe or a vacutainer. A vacutainer is what they use when they collect blood from humans. Um, typically, it just is a, um, a, uh, a, a an open top tube that has um, a double pointed needle. So you put one end of the needle into the um, patient and then the other one is a sealed. Uh, it's got a little rubber sleeve over it. And when you stick a blood tube on it, it moves the rubber sleeve. And so it fills the blood tube. And then when you pull the blood tube off, it closes it up. So it, it keeps it uh, keeps the pressure going without blood flowing everywhere. So um, whenever we're placing a needle into a patient, whether it's a catheter needle or a regular needle, we always want that bevel up. That allows the blood to flow more freely into the um, needle. So this is the bevel. We want it up um, or facing um, towards you. Um, it, with IM, you're going to actually face it uh, away from you, though, if you look back to that, that um, screen um, slide. So the method uh, and the needle gauge is going to depend on our vessel size, so jugular or cephalic, the amount of blood we're going to need, uh, and how we're going to use it and your technician preference. 
um, again, the, the bigger, the smaller the number, the bigger the gauge. So this would be uh, a maybe 16 gauge, I'm sorry, that uh, yeah, 16, 18, 20, 22, and 25 gauge. Um, actually, it might be a little bit 18, 20, uh, 22, uh, 25, and then a um, 30, which I've almost never seen. So, or a tuberculin syringe. Um, so these are, uh, so the, the bigger the number, the smaller the needle. What we have to realize is that these needles are um, not any more painful to the pet the bigger they are. They don't look at a needle and say, oh my gosh, that's going to hurt. Uh, necessarily, they, they don't look at this needle versus this needle and say this one's going to hurt more. That's what we do. It's not what they do. Um, so the bigger the size, in general, the better it is. The only exception to that is if, the, if we suspect the animal has a bleeding issue and then we want a smaller size. Um, so a cat and uh, small dogs, usually we use a 22 gauge needle. And actually, I, th I believe that that's, these two might actually be the same. Um, 22 is the, is the uh, most common size needle that we use for small animals. And uh, this is just a shorter version. So this would be a one inch, this would be a one and a half inch. Um, for large dogs, farm animals, um, we're gonna use a 20 or an 18 gauge needle. 14 gauge um, or 16 gauge for a cow or a horse. Exception to the larger the needle, the better. Um, this is for blood sample collection coagulation profiles. Coagulation is when your blood clots, uh, and there are some animals that have diseases where we have um, some problems with the clotting. Clotting happens um, through a cascade or a series of events, and everything has to be in, in line to in order for clotting to happen effectively. So platelets um, and then different factors that have to be in tissue factor and some other things that have to be in place and happen at a certain time in order for us to get a good clot. So we look at these uh, factors and make sure that we're not missing any of them um, by doing coagulation profiles. Um, some different profiles we can do is called activated clotting time, prothrombin time, and activated partial thromboplastin time. And the differences between those um, are that we can tell what part of the clotting mechanism is broken, broken to a certain extent, and then we can do further testing on that. All coagulation profiles go into this blue top tube because it has a um, very specific um, uh, additive uh, that will not interfere with the test. So blue top tube, clotting issues. Um, we have to have a clean stick, which means we penetrate on the first attempt to have to minimize tissue fluid. So penetrate on the first attempt, get blood uh, without putting a lot of pressure on the syringe. So if you pull the, uh, the harder you pull back on that plunger, the more your pressure you're putting through that uh, needle and the more damage we'll have actually to um, blood cells as it, they come through the needle. We, want it, we may have some frequent sampling when we're doing um, coagulation profiles. We have to be really, really careful uh, with these vessels and we want to use smaller gauge needles. And again, avoid that excessive negative pressure. Hemolysis is the breakdown of red blood cells, and that can happen if you just think about individual red blood cells as they tumble past that needle, getting sliced and lacerated the faster they go. Um, also, the harder you pull back on that plunger, the more likely you are to, to um, decrease the pressure in that vein, and that vein will collapse on your bevel, on your needle, and you won't get any more blood, and you'll do some damage to the vessel. So peripheral venipuncture is when we get blood from the ex extremities. Um, when we are doing, um, trying to get blood or place a catheter, we want to do it as distally as possible. So let's think back to your veterinary terms. Distal is as far from the body as possible. Uh, proximal is close to the body. So if we are occluding the vein, we want to go as, um, if we're doing it, occluding the vein proximal to the vessel or to the uh, to where you're taking the blood from, you want to go as far from that as possible. Okay. So as distally as possible, um, we want to we want to get blood. 
if we're unsuccessful, this is the reason why. So if we're unsuccessful, it means that at that site, we're going to get some clotting because we've damaged the vessel. So we want to go more proximal to that in order to get uh, blood uh, because otherwise the blood won't flow through that clot. So start distally, go proximally. After blood collection, we're going to detach the needle from the syringe, remove the stopper from the tube before the blood is transferred. We're going to reduce, uh, that helps to reduce hemolysis. Um, uh, so again, if we're pulling blood fat quickly through the, uh, the syringe, past the needle, um, that's going to damage the red blood cells. Or if we push blood past that needle forcefully, uh, then that will break blood cells and cause a problem uh, with our sample. If we have an anticoagulant tube, this is a tube that, that will not allow the blood to clot. We use these tubes, if you think back to our uh, previous lecture, we're going to use these tubes, lavender top tubes, in or and with calcium EDTA in it, in order to be able to look at individual cells. So we're going to remove the stopper, gently put the, the blood in there, put the stopper in, and invert it gently to mix it. We're not going to shake it. Okay, we want to fill that tube at least half full with blood because remember there's an additive, there's a liquid in here that if we don't put enough blood in there to mix with the liquid, it will clot. Um, if we put too much blood in there and there's not enough liquid, I'm sorry, it won't clot, but, you won't, but the liquid will overwhelm the blood cells. But if you put too much, it may not clot because you're, there's a certain amount of liquid in. If you put too much blood in, it won't uh, be able to handle that. If you are, have this downloaded and you are um, in presentation mode, you will be able to click on each of these pictures in order to see a, a written uh, description of the technique. So I'll click on this one first. You should know that this is doing a jugular stick, a jugular, this is a jugular restraint, okay? And this person is occluding, the person who's taking blood is occluding the vessel down below. They should be taking distally. I don't know why they're all the way up here, but they should be closer to their uh, hand that's distal from the head. Um, this is placing a, or this is taking blood from the cephalic. This is from the medial saphenous in a cat. This is from the lateral saphenous in a dog. So if we click on this, we can go see um, about jugular venipuncture. Um, how we do it, um, and uh, what the you know the best way to, to do it, and um, how, what to be careful of, and that will take us back here. So if you click on these, this will describe it. Definitely recommend going through that. Marginal ear venipuncture. Um, this is a rabbit. This is a typical thing to do for a rabbit. We can also do this for pigs. We want to do this looking for erythroparasites. Erythroparasites are parasites of the red blood cell. Um, also to monitor blood glucose. Um, we want to warm the pinna, wipe it with alcohol, then nick the vein. Um, I don't always nick the vein, um, but you can uh, nick the vein and massage for a drop of blood that you can collect in a uh, capillary tube. Those are those very thin glass tubes. Um, or you can um, actually use a tuberculin syringe, which is a one milliliter syringe, very small syringe with a small needle, and you can draw blood. It's, it takes a long time because it, it's, blood doesn't flow through here very quickly, um, but you do need to you know, take your time to try to get that much blood. Once you have the blood, these little vessels are pretty fragile, and so they'll bleed pretty easily, so we want to apply firm pressure to try to keep them from getting a hematoma or bruising there. Arterial blood sample collection is very different from doing venous um, blood sample collection. The reason we would get blood from an artery is to primarily assess the patient's ability to ventilate and oxygenate. So it's looking at the partial pressure of carbon dioxide and oxygen to help us understand how the lungs are functioning. We can also get uh, blood pH um, and a uh, some electrolytes from this uh, sample as well. Um, some places where you might get it. So the dorsal metatarsal artery, so that's over the hawk, um, the femoral artery, or the sublingual, so that um, uh, under the tongue. Uh, those are some uh, common places to get it. We do have to be very, very careful when we get it. 
So just about any time we're putting a needle into uh, an animal. As we draw the needle out, we don't want to we don't want to pull continue to pull on the syringe uh, on the plunger as we're bringing it out. If we're pulling on the plunger, that's bringing things into the needle and into the syringe. So when we place the needle into the tissue, when we're when we're getting blood or urine or whatever we're getting, once we have gotten our sample, we want to let go of the plunger and pull the syringe out. That's the same for arterial blood, but it's even more important because if we are pulling on the on the syringe as we're drawing it out we're going to introduce air into the syringe and that will change our results the other thing that is important to keep in mind is that this arterial blood is pumping it's under more pressure than venous blood so it's pumping uh, we're, the heart is pumping through the arteries uh, to the to the tissues and so it's much more likely to develop a hematoma um, or blood is going to come out uh, and under the skin. So we want to be really, really careful as we withdraw the needle. We're going to put digital pressure for a minute, not 15 seconds, not 30 seconds, but a full minute to the puncture site and monitor for bleeding or hematoma for four more minutes. So a total of five minutes watching that site. As soon as we take the needle out, often we're, we're having someone apply pressure as somebody else is taking care of that, that uh, sample, we're going to, as soon as we uh, take it out, we're going to expel air from the syringe and cap it and put it in an ice water bath. For, we do sometimes place arterial catheters. Uh, we would do it for if we need to measure direct arterial blood pressure or if we have to get a number of arterial blood samples. Very commonly done in patients undergoing surgery for long periods of time. Um, especially horses. Most common site would be a dorsal metatarsal. Um, it does uh, it allows us to get um, blood from a little further away from typically where we have surgery going uh, on. We can tape the catheter in, not suture it in. There's less risk of hematoma or hemorrhage there, and it's easier to maintain the catheter position. Um, with horses, uh, just because of where the, anesthesia, the anesthesiologist is standing, often we'll have the arterial catheter placement on the facial artery. Urine collection. Okay, so going from blood, usually venous blood, but sometimes arterial blood, to do, getting urine. It's really important that when we get uh, a blood sample, that we're always getting a urine sample that will give a, a complete understanding of what's, or nearly complete understanding of what's happening within the, um, the chemistries of the animal. Um, the reason we are going to collect it, if we want to look at the urine itself, um, or if we want to culture it, um, we can do a free catch, which is a voiding sample. We can uh, express the uh, animal's bladder, especially if they're sedated um, or don't have control of their bladder. Um, most commonly for culture, we're going to want to do a cystocentesis. That's um, putting a needle directly through the skin and into the abdomen directly into the bladder. Catheterization is another way we can do this. We can place a catheter into the urethra directly into the bladder. And I'm going to go through the pros and cons of each of those. When we get urine, we want to store it in a clean, dry, airtight container. Um, if, it's, if we're going to culture the urine for bacteria, we want to keep uh, have that um, container be sterile. Store it for up to 30 minutes at room temperature, or um, we can refrigerate it in an airtight container, but we want to return it to room temperature before analysis. The sooner we do the urine, um, look at the urine, the more accurate our results are going to be. The longer it sits, the more likely we are to get crystallization of the uh, elements of the urine or some other things growing. Voluntary samples, that's what we call it's good for routine analysis if we're looking at, uh, at the specific gravity um, or if we're looking for bacteria um, or some blood in the urine. Uh, but we, won't, we don't want to use that for cultures. That's going to tell us. It's, not, it's going to give us a lot of false positives. Dogs, um, if, we have, uh, if we have shy patients, we can use a collection device. I used to use a ladle because a long handle would allow me to stick it under the animal without them really noticing what was going on. Or we can put them in their 
cage, if they'll um, go potty in their cage and put them on a raised grate so we can collect it from a clean bottom. Um, for cats, it's a little harder to collect uh, as a free catch, um, but we can put an empty litter box in their uh, kennel or use non-absorbable beads or shredded wax paper. For bladder expression, you want to be really careful. Um, if we're seeing them for a bladder problem or urinal, uh, urine, urination problem, it could be that their bladder is inflamed um, or, or really damaged. So we want to be really careful when we press on it. Um, we can use this for avoided sample or routine analysis. Again, not for culture. Um, it's difficult to use on awake animals, um, but if unless they have a neurologic impairment, meaning they don't have control of their bladder. Um, we can do it either standing or on their side, and we're just going to put uh, put our hand on the side of the abdomen and isolate the, the bladder so it doesn't slip out, and then a apply a firm, steady pres pressure. Too much pressure can rupture the bladder, so we want to be really careful about that. Assistocentesis is when we have what we call a percutaneous, which means through the skin, aspiration, which means to pull um, urine out. Um, and we would want to do that if we want to get a sterile urine sample for analysis or culture insensitivity. It helps to minimize iatrogenic urinary tract infections. Iatrogenic is something that we cause. So um, we can cause a urinary tract infection with catheterization if we're not super careful because we're placing something in the urethra and going the wrong way. So there's a lot of bacteria that lives on the outside of the urethra and if we push through that and push the catheter into the bladder, we can take bacteria with that catheter into the bladder. It can help, cystocentesis can help us uh, localize where we're getting blood from. So if we're seeing blood in the urine and we're taking a cystocentesis and there's blood there, so it will help us understand that there's either blood coming from the kidney or the, um, uh, or the ureter or the bladder. Um, uh, but if there's no blood there, but we're seeing blood in the urine, then the blood is coming further down the urethra, so from the prostate or from the urethra itself. Um, pyuria is, uh, is pus in the urine. Um, and if we're seeing pus in the urine and we're not seeing pus in the urine through cystocentesis, that means then the pus is probably from, if it's a female, from the uterus um, or from further down the ure urethra. And then bacteria. Again, where is it coming from? Some contraindications, reasons we won't want to do cystocentesis, if the bladder's not full enough. So we might be able to wait a couple of hours, give the animal something to drink or some fluids, wait a couple hours, it will fill up. Um, if the animal resists restraint and palpation, so if they're not going to be able to hold still for the procedure, not a good idea to do it because you're sticking a needle into an um, abdomen and we don't want them moving around. Um, if they've had recent abdominal surgery or abdominal trauma, we don't want to do it. If we have a bleeding disorder or pyometra, infection of the uterus, or we have caudal abdominal or bladder tumors. Um, if we have a laceration of the bladder, we don't want to do it. Or if we have a suspected laceration of the bowel um, where we might have peritonitis in the abdomen. I will go through this. I do recommend that you watch a video on this and then when you have a chance, see somebody do this in person. We're going to really remove most but not all the urine because as, as we pull urine out, it's going to bring the sides of the bladder together. Much more chance um, of puncturing through the bla bladder to the other side. Typically use a 22 gauge, one to one and a half inch needle, depends on how big the pet is, um, attached to a 12 milliliter or larger syringe. Uh, we can, I've used a three milliliter syringe, uh, so much smaller syringe uh, without any problem. Um, we can do it standing, uh, we can do it lateral, or they can be in, it says ventral recumbency, but actually it would be dorsal recumbency, so they need to be on their back. Um, I've done it as long as you can feel the bladder, you can stick the bladder. Um, if we're going to do a ventral or ventrolateral insertion of the bladder, we want a short distance um, uh, going at a 45 degree angle through the wall. So what does that mean? That means we're holding the bladder in place. The trigone is where the bladder um, narrows into the urethra. And if we hold that area, um, as we feel the bladder, it feels like a, 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 um, 
a water balloon. So you're basically holding the water balloon by the, the opening, okay? And if we hold it there, then it won't be able to scooch out of place at all. So we're going to feel along the bladder and then trap it, not pinch it, but trap it between our fingers um, so that it can't move down into the pelvis. Uh, once we have it in place, then we're going to go just above uh, where we have our fingers and uh, directly into the bladder. Aspirate urine into the syringe once, we've, once we feel like we're in the bladder and then release the, the plunger, right? Release negative pressure. We don't want to pull things as we come out of there and then withdraw the needle. We can also use an ultrasound uh, to guide us with a cystocentesis because it can help us to identify the bladder. So catheterization, we may do it catheterize animals to get a urine sample collection. More, more commonly, we're catheterizing to empty the bladder if we have an impaired patient or relieve a urethral obstruction or to put, uh, do a radiographic study where we're putting contrast material into the bladder so we can see the wall of the bladder, make sure it's okay, and, um, and then quantifying urinary output. So if we're giving an animal fluids, we want to see about the same amount of fluids coming out of the animal. Um, so we want to uh, measure what's going in and what's coming out. So some complications to catheterization, we can introduce urinary tract infection to the bladder. Um, we can cause urethral or bladder irritation and trauma. And there are a lot of large animals we can't do this in because they have, um, uh, they have a, a, a penis. Uh, most of the ruminants and pigs have a penis that has a, a pretty good flexure to it. It's called a sigmoid flexure. It looks like an S-curve, and it's hard to get them catheterized. When we're, when we're collecting urine, um, especially free catch, um, we want to clean the prepuce, which is the sheath over the penis or the vulva. We want to clean it twice and dry it. We want to wear sterile gloves when we're catching or connecting anything to the um, catheter. We want to pre-measure the catheter externally so that we know how far um, we need to insert that catheter. You don't want to put it in too far because it actually will tie a knot itself into a knot in the bladder. Um, we want to, if we're going to need to collect or quantify those fluids, we want to um, uh, collect it in a sterile collection bag uh, or an empty sterile fluid bag. So fluids that you use to give um, animals IV, you can keep those, keep them sterile, and use them to collect urine. Want to measure the, the contents, look at them, and empty them periodically. We want to always inspect indwelling catheters for occlusion or they're blocked in some way and monitor for adequate output. We want to remove those catheters as soon as possible. Um, if we have to keep a catheter in, we want to replace those every four to five days. For an indwelling catheter, we want to connect it to a reservoir bag, uh, suture the catheter to the animal, um, inspect for obstructions or kinks, and then talk about what we're going to do for long-term placement. Excessive length, so if it's too long, it can kink. If it's advanced too far, the catheter can tie itself in a knot within the urinary bladder. When we remove it, um, we want to do a slow and controlled move, uh, removal. So when we place it, we can use lube. As we remove it, I often in, um, infuse saline to lubricate as we're pulling it out. Male dog catheterization, probably the easiest one to do. We can have them standing or on their side. Um, if we need to clip long hairs so that we can keep it as clean as possible, then we want to flush the prepuce with some chlorhex solution and rinse it out. Um, we'll expose the penis tip and uh, have uh, uh, sterile, uh, clean it and rinse it. Um, have some sterile gloves with sterile lubricant on the top of an aseptic or sterile catheter. And then we're going to um, insert that catheter into the urethra uh, as far as that pre-measured length. Um, we're then going to connect to a sterile syringe and gently aspirate or connect to a collecting device. And we're going to take a little butterfly tape. We're going to take a, a piece of tape, um, uh, fold it in half, and then put it half around of it so it kind of looks like that butterfly on the butterfly um, catheter. And then we can suture that in place. Female dogs are a little harder to do. You do, do need to use a speculum with a light source. Uh, you have to place them very specifically. Um, you do have to use sterile 
uh, gloves, you can do this blindly you, you, if you feel it. It is not something we um, expect you to do, but it may be something you learn to do. Male catheterization, catheterization, it does say rare, but we do see a lot of urethral obstructions in male cats, typically obstructed with mucus. Um, we are going to put them under sedation or a general anesthetic to get them relaxed enough to allow us to do this. Um, retracting their um, prepuce and exposing their penis, and we have to grasp their penis, so that's not very comfortable, so that's why we sedate them. Um, then we want to um, prep them uh, aseptically, so a sterile prep, and then try to uh, catheterize them with a short catheter. So again, we want to use as clean, sterile uh, procedure as possible um, and make sure that uh, we've got a good flow of urine through that. Obviously, anytime we place a catheter, a good idea to put an e-collar on. Female cat catheterization, we almost never do. Um, it's very similar to doing a male or a, a female dog, but it's much smaller and you have to do it mostly blindly. Feces, um, we do use a lot of um, fecal uh, material in our diagnostic techniques, especially because a lot of animals come in with vomiting and diarrhea. Um, so the easiest way to get it is a fresh sample, should be as fresh as possible. Um, definitely should not be dry and hard. Uh, we want to get it, we can get it from the ground, the floor, the litter box, or the cage. We can use a lubricated fecal loop. These are um, plastic loops that we can insert into the rectum, twist, and gather feces that way. We can use a gloved finger in the rectum. If we have a fresh sample, we want to keep it in a sealed plastic container. And if we're going to have any delay, 24 hours, um, we want to refrigerate that. We want to look at the sample uh, first grossly, so just by your, your eye, and then microscopically. We want to um, take a look at for mucus, blood, any parasites we can see, and then uh, under the microscope, um, eggs, ova. Um, Fecal, uh, I have it, it says here that it's routinely performed in practice. What I'm finding over the last couple of years is that many places are actually sending their fecal samples off to a lab to have them look for it because they can use a fecal centrifuge in order to spin the sample down and concentrate this and have a much better uh, chance of seeing it. It's also a good way to keep contaminants out of your clinic. Um, we do have a fecal centrifuge in our lab, and we will be showing you how to use it. Thoracocentesis um, is when we would place a needle into the thorax or chest of an animal. We would have to do this if we're having some uh, pleural filling defects. Pleural filling means the area around the lungs is filling with air or fluid. And anything that fills that space around the lungs with air and fluid is going to keep the lungs from expanding. It will collapse the lungs. So if we have presentation of tachypnea, which is increased <clears throat> rate of breathing or respiratory distress, or if we listen to them, auscultate them, auscultation reveals diminished or absent breath sounds and muffled heart sounds. That would indicate that they're not breathing well. There's something in there. So this is a... If we were to take a cross section of an animal, this is the back of the animal with the muscles up here in the spine. This is the sternum. Here is the heart. Here are the lungs. There is this pleural space around the lungs that is um, lubricated. So when the lungs um, rub up against it, it's not painful. Um, and it's a space that allows the lungs to expand. If this area fills with fluid or air, it will collapse the lungs and the lungs will not be able to expand. So this would be an indication for putting a needle into this space. I will say that it is very dangerous. Um, you could place the needle and puncture into the lung and that could cause more bleeding into that space and cause damage to the lung. So very often, this needle will actually be a catheter and over the needle catheter will place the needle in to get into this area and then thread the catheter in and take the needle out so it doesn't uh, puncture the lung. Uh, this is called a stopcock and there's a syringe here. That stopcock helps us to, um, uh, to block uh, so that it's open here and then if we were to flip it sideways that would shut this off so that we don't have any air 
going into or out of uh, the lungs if we don't want it. Abdominocentesis is the same thing, uh, except in the abdomen. So if we need to aspirate fluid from the abdomen, um, or if we need to diagnose what kind of fluid is in the abdomen, uh, that's why we would want to do it. If there is a penetrating abdominal injury or we suspect there's pyometra, we would not want to do it. So those are our contraindications. Some complications of doing an abdominocentesis. So a lot of times, uh, doing an abdominocentesis um, gives us a false negative. And that's because when we stick a needle in there, uh, we don't know where the, um, uh, the organs are. I mean, the organs are in very specific locations but the intestines move around a lot. There could be a lot of fat in the area. Um, we don't know where our needle is necessarily going into. There's a spot where we can go where we don't think there is anything and fluid should collect, but fluid doesn't always collect in that spot. It could be collecting in a different spot. So a lot of times we'll place a, a needle in there and we don't get anything. That would, um, but there's, if there's still something in there, that would be a false negative. If it is negative, one of the things we can do is we can put fluid into, so sterile fluid into that peritoneal space, which is the space around the, the organs. Uh, so we put some fluid in there and then suck the fluid out and see if we get anything weird uh, out with that fluid. Uh, the most common complication is a failure to obtain a sample or a skin hemorrhage or protrusion of omentum. Omentum is, uh, is a sac in which the um, the, the intestines are held. Um, it kind of holds the intestines in place. Um, it also is, a, is the body's bandage to any damage to anything in the abdomen. So if you create uh, damage or tissue, tissue uh, damage to something as you stick a needle in there, the omentum is going to actually go to that spot. And if it's big enough hole, the omentum can actually come out. Um, doesn't often happen the most common thing we'll see is a false negative. But if you are uh, not careful about where you put your needle, you could penetrate the bowel, the spleen, damage the xiphoid process, which is the end of the sternum, or introduce bacteria. So we have to be very clean and very careful uh, when we place our needle. Transtracheal wash is when we get tracheobronchial materials, so things that are further down in the, in the respiratory system. Um, by bypassing the mouth and the oropharynx. So a lot of bacteria in the mouth and the, the back of the mouth, the oropharynx. If we can go beyond that, we can get what is actually causing the issue within the lungs. So it can diagnose uh, lower airway and lung disease um, uh, or uh, acute bronchopneumonia. It helps us to, to um, detect uh, microorganisms um, that, are, that may be present or if there are parasite eggs or larvae in the lungs helps us to understand what infectious agents might be there or if there's neoplastic cells um, or if we have an animal in severe respiratory distress. That's, those are the indications. Contraindications, if they're in severe respiratory distress, it can cause them to stop breathing. So that would be a problem. Some complications from the procedure, we can have hemorrhage because we're, um, we're actually going through the skin, which is, um, has a lot of blood vessels, uh, in, directly into the trachea. Um, we can cause a pneumomediastinum or a pneumothorax um, if we're uh, going too far um, and too roughly. So we can introduce air into, the, into that area or some subcutaneous emphysema or air in the tissues around the trachea. It can cause acute dyspnea, acute difficulty breathing, or we can introduce uh, infection um, by not being careful with our septic, uh, aseptic technique. We do want to keep the patient awake. We can sedate them a little bit, give them an anti-anxiety medication, but we want them to have a cough reflex because that will help to get things out of their um, lungs. We are going to place some fluid in a little bit of fluid in the lungs and pull it out as much of that fluid out as possible uh, in order to get whatever comes with that fluid. So we can do it um, through the skin. Uh, we can do it, use a through the needle catheter. Um, so place the needle in the catheter like we would do a thorac thoracocentesis. Or we can do go through with a sterile uh, tracheal tube and put it directly in their trachea uh, and then put another tube through that um, and do an endotracheal lavage. Um, 
when we get our sample, we want to uh, use a syringe, seal it with a rubber stopper and refrigerate it. If we're going to make a smear right away on a, sli a slide, uh, we want to make it one layer thick, so very thin smear. Uh, there are some stains, specific stains that you can use in order to look at that uh, in-house. Um, so we'll, what we're looking for are some, there are some normal cells that we'll be able to find, um, also those pathologic cells, so things that are causing the disease, but we also have to realize that we're going to see some mucus, some proteinaceous exudate, and some uh, cellular fragments. All right, arthrocentesis is when we aspirate fluid from a joint. Um, indications for doing an arthrocentesis would be if we have a persistent or cyclic fever, so a temperature that goes up above normal um, periodically, daily, every other day, um, and we don't know, we call this a fever of unknown origin, we don't know where that infection or inflammation is, we don't know what is causing the fever. Have a generalized stiffness or limb lameness, uh, especially associated with systemic signs, or we have a specific limb lameness. Some contraindications are, would be if we have skin infection, so a moderate to severe pyoderma. We don't want to go through that skin uh, infection because that's going to introduce infection into the joint. Or a lick granuloma, which is when we have an animal um, that constantly licks one area and causes a thickening of the skin there because that, again, is going to introduce uh, bacteria into the joint. Um, also, if we have trauma with or without hemorrhage into the joint, any blood that we're getting out of that joint is not going to help us uh, identify the issue. Some equipment, um, some needles, syringes, uh, microscope slide, cover slips, sterile gloves, clippers, aseptic and sterile uh, surgical prep supplies. Um, I'm not going to go through this arthrocentesis procedure other than to say it's really, really, really important that you are um, very careful uh, when, you're, when you're putting uh, a needle in. It's got to be aseptic. Uh, we might look at the carpus, the tarsus or the stifle in, in dogs and cats. Um, and with horses, it's whatever joint is causing the issue. Um, the first thing that we do when we do get fluid back is we look at its um, viscosity. Joint fluid should be fairly viscous, meaning it has some elasticity to it, some thickness to it. Um, that's what you want in your joint to provide uh, a pain-free movement. So what we do is we take a drop on our gloved finger and we put our uh, index finger on it and then slowly pull those apart and see how far we can get that to hold, that viscosity to hold. Um, the, uh, we want to culture sometimes that joint fluid um, and do uh, look at it, the cells as well. Um, bone marrow aspiration uh, is something else that we do with dogs and cats and birds, um, horses even. Uh, this helps us to evaluate the cells in the bone marrow. Um, if we're looking for a non-responsive anemia, that means that the bone marrow is not responding to lower red blood cells in the, in the blood, and uh, we need that bone marrow to make more red blood cells. If it's not working, we need to look at what's going on in the bone marrow. Thrombocytopenia is when we have low platelets. Neutropenia is when we have low white cells. Pancytopenia is when we have um, uh, all the white cells, all, all the cells are decreased. If we have hematopoietic malignancies, that means cancer of the blood cells, polycythemia, so too many blood cells, uh, inappropriate red blood cell response, or if we need to clinically stage lymphomas or mast cell tumors. So a lot of different reasons to do that. Some contraindications is that is if we have a clotting factor abnormality, so we're always going to do a coagulation panel first, or if we have severe thrombocytopenia, because once we enter that bone marrow, it's really hard to stop the bleeding. Complications would be infection at the aspirate site, damage to soft tissue structures, and a hematoma. So I'm not going to go really into this other than to say there are very specific sites, um, bigger bones um, that we want to uh, try to access. Um, we need to realize that aged patients' bone marrow is always going to be less active in long bones. We want to uh, realize that if, if we want to use very strict aseptic technique, just like we, when we use uh, with joints, and we want to do um, a companion CBC reticulates, reticulose site count within 20 hours before or after the aspiration so we can compare uh, peripheral blood and marrow 
uh, cell populations. All right, fine needle aspiration. We're going to use this for getting tissue cells from a mass. This helps us to, to aid in deciphering between inflammation or hyperplasia. Hyperplasia is when tissue um, cell, uh, cells grow abnormally. Could be cancerous or could be something totally benign. Some complications would be if we um, create minor hemorrhage, some tissue damage, or infection. So we're going to use needles, a syringe, and some microscope slides and surgical scrub or alcohol. Um, so we want to get these tissue cells from, from the mass. We're just going to be able to look at cells, um, not the, the structure of the tissue. Um, gonna aid, it's going to aid us in deciphering between inflammation and hyperplasia. Um, the complications would be minor hemorrhage. Um, or oh, I went over that. Sorry, is that two of the same? I went over that already. Sorry. Okay, um, the procedure. Again, I'm, I don't want to necessarily go through the procedure. Um, in detail. However, I want you to have this uh, in hand because this is something that you will be doing. So you're going to surgically prepare the area because we're, we're not looking for a culture, we're not looking for bacteria, we're looking for cells. Um, you're going to secure the mass and you're going to introduce the needle into the mass and then redirect it, uh, trying to get a lot of cells lined up in that needle. Or you can um, draw attach a syringe and draw cells into that needle. Um, when you take it out, uh, you're going to remove the needle from the syringe if you have a syringe attached, introduce air into that syringe, put it back on the uh, needle, and then put it uh, drops or uh, cell, the cells onto a slide. Then you're going to take another slide and put it on top and draw those slides apart. Those are the techniques that we use in order to get information from pets about what's going on in their body. If you have questions, please bring them to class. And uh, remember that there is a lot of extra work here. I do want you to go through explanations and watch the videos, whatever the best way is for you to learn about these things. This is stuff that I will be testing on you on for a year, for a year from now. So I really want you to understand this stuff.